Thanks for listening to the Innovation Experts, a new global podcast brought to you by Farnell, Newark, and Element 14, where you can find out about the latest innovations in the world of electronics. Hello and welcome to our next interview from the Innovation Experts, a global podcast by Farnell, Newark, and Element 14. I'm Cliff Ortmeyer and I'm the Global Head of Technical Marketing, joining you from Chicago. Today we've got Mike Hoffman, who's Product Manager with Keysight, based in Colorado Springs. Mike's responsible for managing product launches for Keysight's mid-range oscilloscopes and their subsequent life cycles. We'll be talking about innovations in the industry, what really matters in test equipment development, and what really differentiates test equipment today. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Appreciate you, Cliff. Thanks for having me. So let's start off with just getting a little background on you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to uh, Keysight eventually. Yeah, still quite fortunate. Got my Bachelor's of Electrical Engineering at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, the real Cal Poly. Sorry, Pomona. And through my time there, all of our EE labs were stocked with HP and then Agilent oscilloscopes. Or I think there were 3000 X's or 2000 X's, but that was kind of my first exposure to, to test equipment. And so when I was getting ready to graduate, there they were at the job fair on campus and they had this job called Technical Marketing Engineer. And that really intrigued me. And about 10 years later, here I am having a great time. So I've been with the Agilent and now Keysight's oscilloscopes division out of Colorado Springs since 2012. And in that time, I've been a product manager, business development engineer, and a few other hats, but currently product manager for a couple of what we call our, our mid-range scopes, which I'm sure we'll get into more depth on later. Yeah, actually, you mentioned HP and Agilent, and back when I was first starting out, I was working on passives and doing some RF testing on passives, and I used an HP network analyzer, and I went out to somewhere in California, and I saw a beautiful mountain range, and I thought, that's this is where I need to be. I never made it, but I understand, but I wanted to get a little bit of history because you mentioned HP and Agilent. What are all the different brands that key sites had, and how has that progressed over the years? Yeah, it's been quite a story. It's been about six, seven years now that we've been Keysight, but to this day, we still got customers that that uh, are, are kind of curious as to what happened. But back in the 30s, Hewlett Packard started as a test and measurement company. In fact, their first product that Bill and David created was an oscillator that was used in the movie Fantasia back in the day. And so over the decades, our prowess and test and measurement evolved. And then you know, at some point we started delving into consumer electronics like printers and computers and things like that, things that you recognize HP for today. And so in the late 1990s, uh, they decided that these two businesses were different enough fundamentally from not only a business standpoint, but from an investor standpoint to split them out. So Hewlett Packard, HP kind of uh, continued to soldier on doing consumer electronics and servers and things like that. And then Agilent was created for everything test and measurement related. Well, what happened there is we had two huge branches of test and measurement. We had electronic test and measurement, which was a relatively stable business. And then we had our life sciences measurements, so like chromatography and spectrum, gas spectrumography and things that I'm definitely not qualified to talk about. And again, those two businesses were different enough where they decided to, again, split the company. And, and uh, two for two, we got, uh, got selected to go off and create our own new business with a new name and that became Keysight. So the upshot of that is now we are back to what Hewlett Packard started as, which is a pure electronics test and measurement company. And that's really all we do. We've acquired some companies along the road, uh, some things related to quantum computing and testing along those lines and network test and network security, but it's really 100% focused on electronic test and measurement, which is kind of cool. means we get to reinvest into our core competency versus kind of funding these other businesses that have kind of ballooned and taken over in the past. Yeah. So can you give us just a quick overview in terms of all the different product categories you guys do carry or make? <laughs> uh, yeah, I won't get into uh, all the detail. If anyone's curious, just go to our keysight.com website and there's products and services. We make a lot of equipment from, like I said, quantum computing test to things that you all probably know and love, like power supplies and function generators. Probably our biggest product categories that we that we sell the most of network analyzers, spectrum analyzers and signal analyzers, scopes. And then a big part of our business right now is writing the, the 5G test wave. We were pretty early to market as far as having 5G test solutions, since that's a pretty big chunk of our business today, too. Yeah, 
I know that when I've looked at your equipment, and obviously we sell it, the, the range in pricing in terms of the product portfolio is really quite wide. I mean, can you explain like what are some of the performance characteristics or why some things are so high end versus uh, say on the lower end, what are you getting out of those and what are the applications that really require that kind of depth? It's pretty wild because the market needs for, uh, I'll speak to oscilloscopes specifically, but this is true across many different product lines. Uh, there's needs at say the university level. Hey, we need a, an oscilloscope for EE101 that can show a waveform on the screen and we don't really need any whiz bang features. And so we got scopes that start at 500 US dollars. And then we have people working on cutting edge, bleeding edge technology where say our 110 gigahertz real-time UXR series that costs $1.5 million, there's literally nothing else on the planet that can make those kind of measurements. And so that's where you end up seeing the price. Not only is it very expensive to develop and manufacture these kind of technologies, but we have these crazy market niches that we serve with the technology we've created that can command these kind of prices. So you're seeing you now orders of magnitude and difference. And it's kind of a, a really cool thing from an engineering standpoint. You see on one end, you know, kind of a marvel in cost engineering where we're able to take this awesome system on a chip technology and produce it and make it profitable in a $400 box. But also this crazy cutting edge stuff that took a decade to, and God knows how many millions of dollars of R&D spend to create that are doing things that have literally never been done before. So it's kind of fun to be a part of that and try to help promote and sell all these awesome pieces of technology our R&D teams come up with. So I'm guessing that like everything over time, the features start to move down into the lower price models. And uh, I'm guessing the yeah. 1.5 million ones, you're talking about <laughs> hand built, you know, they're basically Ferraris, if you will. How long does it really take for that performance to slowly come down and be more mainstream? Any ideas on that? Yeah, so the big driver that kind of pushes these price gaps is bandwidth, which I, I think I took a really long time to essentially get to the, the point that bandwidth is generally the biggest driver. And we've seen it in the past where like a one gigahertz oscilloscope used to be the Ferrari of scopes. And then over time, as technology progresses, the things that it took to make a one gigahertz of scope become cheaper to produce, or we come up with new ways to do it to make it more affordable. So a couple real world examples I can give you like right now in our portfolio, the same chips that power the that $1.5 million UXR series scope has been actually down deployed all the way down to our UXR series that costs $20,000. And we had some ASIC technology that launched in our high end InfiniVision scopes that are now available in that $500 scope. So with time and as cost of manufacturing goes down and, and all that over time happens, we're able to down deploy these technologies into quote unquote, you know, less expensive oscilloscopes and everyone wins. It's a good time to be an oscilloscope shopper right now. I can tell you that. Yeah, exactly. One of the things I've noticed is that a sweet spot, let's call it, is around the, the one gigahertz scopes. You know, we sell, it's one of our mm -hmm. you know most popular products of yours, but yet there's so many different variations in that range. Is there a big difference between them or what? It's almost like looking at multimeters. I've seen so many different types of multimeters. I'm like, I don't even know how to market this stuff because there's so, <laughs> so many nuances to them. Is it the same way in scopes? Oh yeah, for sure. So I can definitely see a customer getting some analysis paralysis or they're out there shopping. Of course, what big part of my job is to be keeping a pulse on the market and what our competitors are doing and what's available out there and where do we fit and all that. And by my last count, there were 35 discrete one gigahertz oscilloscope models available for sale on the market today from all the different manufacturers. It's wild. So there's a couple big differentiators when you're looking at a scope and probably the biggest one is like operating system and some basic things like does it have the memory depth I need? Does it have the applications that I need? And a lot of them do. But honestly, there's a lot of really good scopes out there. And we laugh sometimes because it's like our customers aren't getting fired for picking one brand over the other. So what can we be doing to actually try to differentiate the product and separate Keysight from the pack? Because it is it's a pretty busy space. I know we mentioned before that there's probably thousands of white papers and things like that out there, but realistically if I'm looking for an oscilloscope nowadays, what are some of the core things that I need to look at and maybe some of the things that might be different than other types of scopes, even in terms of like their sampling methods and stuff like that. So if you can give me just a couple of the high level ones that everybody talks about, but what are other areas that you need to look for and say, ah, oh, that's why this thing's $300 and this one's $30,000. Right. 
at the end of the day, can the oscilloscope you're looking at make the measurements you need? And so the bare bone fundamentals there are, does it have the real time bandwidth and accordingly the sample rate? And if you want to look at the relationship between the two, we got some good white papers, as you say. But does it have the fast enough to capture the signals of interest and the noise levels? Does it have a low enough noise floor where I'm not worrying about any sort of error coming from my test equipment impacting my measurements? And like I said, there's some exceptions. There's some quote unquote lesser models out there that maybe have higher levels of noise or you know, things like that. But there's a lot of good options out there. So then you got to go to kind of the next layer. So does it have the application support I need? Am I running any sort of specialized power measurements? Am I working with a specific serial bus that I want to decode? Is there some sort of thing like that? Probes is a big one too, Keysight. And there's a few other manufacturers that have really good probe portfolios. So can I get the signal from my device under test to the input of the scope safely without causing a fire? <laughs> or uh, have, again, having the probe impact or introduce more air to my measurement. And then the last thing I might actually take a look at would be customer support. So you might want to think about, say, test driving their pre-sales support or uh, pushing on their sales engineers or application engineers a little bit, because oftentimes you're only buying a scope maybe every seven, 10 years. So what is that next seven or 10 years going to look like with that scope you picked? Right. What about one of the trends that obviously we all see is a scope is no longer a scope. I mean, uh, quite honestly, Till I started doing some deep dives, I didn't even realize how much stuff was integrated into a scope. I know when we went to, you know, integrating other devices, let's call them into scopes, the options that are out there right now are kind of mind boggling. Not only <laughs> that, but just in terms of the functions. I mean, where do you see things now? And why do you think we've seen the progression of integration into scopes um, in terms of functions, as well as just overall hardware features and other types of instruments being integrated in? And where do you see things going? That's a great question, because I love talking about kind of the futurology of test equipment. Like we were talking about this morning, you're like, hey, you know, we used to have SMUs and suddenly they're starting to source measure units and they're starting to integrate features. I think there's like basic oscilloscope functions and SMUs now. Now oscilloscopes have pretty much every scope on the market nowadays has like a function generator built in or some sort of uh, voltmeter counter. This started in the 90s with the invention of the what we call the NSO, where I think like Hewlett Packard at the time had integrated like a logic analyzer essentially into the oscilloscope. And now everyone has that. It's like the MSO for mixed signals. Protocol analysis and decode, you could say, oh, we kind of shove a protocol analyzer into these scopes. So the idea isn't necessarily to replace everything on the bench. A standalone logic analyzer is going to run laps around any sort of MSO features you see in any oscilloscope in the world today, because it's a dedicated piece of equipment. But the idea is if you need a waveform generator to, to pump out a square wave every once in a while, say, oh, do you want to go buy a separate box and keep it calibrated and keep the firmware updated and remember how to use it every single time and all of that? Or do you just want to plug into a BNC on the front of the scope and click go? So that's kind of the idea as it stands today is kind of covering the 90% case for some of these basic test tools that are on the bench, but it's still scope forward. But something our CTO has talked quite a bit about is trying to knock down the walls or the silos that exist within Keysight specifically. The way our company was previously organized is we had like an oscilloscopes division and a power supply division and a network analyzer division. And we all worked kind of independently oftentimes in separate locations, even different time zones, different countries. And it fostered a lot of innovation and creativity, but not a whole lot of, say, integration between pieces of equipment. I won't get into too many specifics, but when we first put a waveform generator in our oscilloscopes about 10 years ago, the wave gen division called up our product planner and was like, what the heck? You're taking our business. So our CTO is trying to get rid of that dynamic. And hopefully in the future, we'll see kind of like a true all-in-one box where we have the technology from our waveform generators actually inside the oscilloscope, the true form technology. Or maybe it's a modular kind of device where you got an oscilloscope card and a wave gen card and a network analyzer card and a power supply card. And you kind of have this actual all-in-one toolbox that plays nice together. And so there's some things that we're doing as Keysight to try to make that happen. So like Pathwave is what it's called specifically. But uh, that's the way I see it going in the future. It's like having a computer and you can plug in whatever video card you want. It's like you got this test box and you can plug in whatever tools you want. That's my prediction, at least. Those functions are going to be 
let's call them pretty spot on. They're not going to be just like a nice little add-on that, eh, you know, if you just need a square wave, here you go. They are actually already pretty heavy duty unless you're doing something that really needs a dedicated piece of equipment. Right, right. And I might be underselling some of the features you'll find in, in oscilloscopes today, like a lot of the wave gens are actually pretty good, but they're not the level of the benchtop unit. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we went through the, I think the entire company, every quote division as, as it existed at the time was told to make like a PXI version of the products. So you can go find like a PXI version of some of our scopes or uh, different pieces of equipment like that. But I see that kind of going to the next level in the next 10 years. Yeah. So I know that we've talked about the integration of products, integration of, let's say, piece of equipment into things, but I know there's uh, a lot more functionality. What about things like debugging, like USB uh, and things like that? How common is that becoming now and how many things can you really pack into a device? Yeah, it's actually funny you ask that. Just yesterday, I was talking to the manager of our Keysight Care support team and just trying to get a pulse on what that's looking like for our customers right now. And they identified it. one of the top reasons customers call into our support line for help is to talk about USB 2.0 of all things, which has been around forever. But it's getting to the point where it's, again, the kind of that technology creep. It's not just in our products, it's in everything. USB 2.0 has become ubiquitous to the point where pretty much everyone's using it. And you kind of use it as a stepping stone to get to, say, the USB 3s or the 4s because you got to be backwards compatible. So even the, the people on the bleeding edge of USB are working with 2.0, maybe for the first time. Then you get a lot of people integrating it for the first time. So yeah, the oscilloscope is a fantastic tool for USB testing 2.0 specifically on the products that are in Farnell's line card. So we can do triggering and decoding, meaning that we can translate the ones and zeros and throw that up on screen in real time, and also selectively hunt for and display certain packets or pieces of data, what have you. But where it really gets fun is in the compliance testing side. So we have a lot of different fixtures and commands that you'd send to your device to spit out test patterns. And that's where things get a bit more complicated. And that's where it's really nice to kind of have like, uh, you know, the JIT limbs of the world. He's our USB expert. And we've had him on our podcast a few times. And so you have access to those kind of people who literally sit on the USB implementers forum and take a seat in developing the tests required to get USB certification. So yeah, there's a lot of support for that within Keysight, no matter what speed of USB or any other bus you're working on. And we, we are always trying to broaden our set of tools for customers there. Yeah. What do you see from an application standpoint? What do you see that's driving additional or new capabilities coming in? I know you mentioned 5G before. It's obviously everybody's kind of working in that area. Where do you see the next phase of things or people or applications that are driving additional requests for functionality on the scopes? Right. There's kind of two paths here that kind of end up getting to the same destination. One thing we've been noticing, we've made a bunch of probes and applications around power, what we call power integrity. And this is people measuring DC voltages on power distribution networks or power rails around their design. And in the past, if you had a 12 volt power rail, it's like, oh, okay, if it's 12 volts. If it's 11.5, if it's 12.3, whatever, it's probably fine. But now we're getting to an era where things are down in the below single digits of voltages and moving to higher frequencies and have tighter tolerances because we're trying to use less power and things like that. So people are trying to look for, say, millivolt ripples on a 1.5 volt signal and they got to zoom in and, and do some crazy things. And so we've seen basically that the needs for what used to be lower speed signals where there were higher margins of error suddenly needing much tighter margins of error, much tighter tolerances, even if the signals aren't getting that much faster. So that's one example. The other one that kind of gets to that same one is, is like real time eye diagrams and jitter measurements. If anyone out there who's ever worked on, say, multi gigabit links, that's kind of standard fare. You got to pull up an eye diagram to check the signal integrity. You might need to do some jitter separation and some diagnosis there. But that was generally kind of a don't care for people working, say, under a gigahertz. But that's definitely changing. So actually one of our most popular requested applications on our EXR series oscilloscopes and our S series oscilloscopes. So we're starting to see these things that used to be super high end testing needs starting to trickle down to folks as we advance into trying to be more energy efficient and things like that. Design tolerances are getting a lot tougher. I've looked at the EXR series before and it's 
pretty much a mainstream device, but it's basically power packed. What have you guys put into that one and where do you see it kind of evolving to? Because it, it does seem to be a really strong mainstream player. Yeah, for sure. So the EXR series was a really fun product to bring to market because we kind of took the best of everything we had ever, ever built and put it all into one box. So starting from the bottom, it has the fast waveform update rate and the built-in tools that you generally used to see on our, or you do see on our InfiniVision X series scopes. So it's got like a 50 megahertz arbitrary function generator. It's got three 10 digit counters. It's got a four and a half digit voltmeter, three and a half digit voltmeter and you know, all that good stuff. It has all the hard front end hardware and low noise technology and digitization technology from our S series. So it's got super low noise and 10 bit ADC and all that good stuff. And then we took that again, that ASIC from that $1.5 million UXR scope and put it in there as well. So it can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, later this year, we're working on doing hardware accelerated mask testing and hardware accelerated visual triggering and a bunch of other things that I won't get into. But yeah, basically again, down deploying technology that's essentially already been quote unquote paid for and developed for other uses and kind of creating this cool all-in-one Swiss army knife. I know that analogy is a little tired, but, but that's the idea. It's something you can kind of carry around. It's got room to grow, so you can totally upgrade it. You can upgrade channels, you can upgrade bandwidth on it. And so it's a really good platform for, for people who want to spend a little bit more upfront, but know they have a lot of runway moving forward. Right. So if, if somebody wants to actually choose a scope obviously we've talked about a lot of the different features here any places you'd recommend they go look at or any guides that can help people say ah this is the one that i need i would highly recommend everyone just reach out to the vendor or to the supplier like a farnell and they often have demo units available or know somebody who can get you one and you can have a scope drop shipped to you to play with for a week and even if a week is a little excessive i, I can't imagine anyone has a, a month free to play with oscilloscopes but again, this is something that you're probably only buying once every seven to 10 years, unless you work in a very, very fortunate environment that's got a, a ton of money for capital. And so you want to do your homework, spend at least a couple of hours and on the phone specifically with somebody from that manufacturer and get a live demo and get your hands on the thing because uh, there's really no replacement for stick time. So that is my number one recommendation when shopping is, yeah, you can find all the information you want out on the internet, but at the end of the day, nothing beats actually test driving the product. I mean, these cost as much as cars, so why not test drive the oscilloscope as well? Exactly, and we actually do have that service as well, so that's a good point. If somebody wants to contact you or learn more about Keysight, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Me specifically? Um, I actually deleted all my social media many years ago, not a huge fan, but you can reach me at Keysight Mike on Twitter. So I do play around there a little bit. So you can shoot me a tweet there, or of course you can just reach out to uh, whoever your contact might be at, at Farnell. And most people know how to find me given enough time. We're all pretty tightly connected with our suppliers and our distributors. Yeah, I, I do like the I've given up social media, but you can reach me on Twitter. It's kind of like I gave up coffee, but I go to Starbucks every morning. But, so uh, I get it. Right, I get right. it. You know um, what? Yeah, I never said I wasn't a hypocrite. <laughs> just like to have our options open that's we can do that <laughs> um hey so uh you know this has been actually really interesting and uh, i'm glad you cleared up a lot of things for me and i'm sure for a lot of the uh, listeners one thing i do like to do just to get to know you a little bit better uh, and let the people know you is throw some quick fire questions at you at the end of the round here so if you're open for that let's talk about what's the craziest application that you've seen uh, one of the products used in yeah, good question. A couple things come to mind, but one personally, it was my last business trip before the pandemic and I was out in, in Japan and uh, they were using our oscilloscopes in a particle accelerator, which is pretty cool. And right in the middle of me doing a presentation, there was an earthquake. So that was <laughs> a little memorable, but yeah, there's some crazy applications that people use their scopes and the crazier ones are probably confidential to the point where I can't know about them. But yeah, the particle accelerator comes to mind. That just amazes me. I've always wanted to go down there, but they'd never let me because I'd ask so many questions, they'd kick me out. So <laughs> that's a pretty good one to have on the res. So how about you? Uh, what are you doing this weekend? What projects are you working on? What are you getting into? Yeah, thanks for asking. I got a pool tournament on Saturday, and depending on how far our team advances in that, that might be all I'm doing this weekend. But hopefully in my evenings, I'll be helping my, my got a friend over actually right now in the garage, helping me rebuild an old Toyota. And then I got just picked up a 96 Corvette Grand Sport. Google that one. It's probably the coolest paint job of any car I've ever had. 
but I've got a rebuild kit. So I'm probably going to be ripping out some electronics and practicing some soldering on my sports car, which probably isn't the best idea, but Hey, you know, everything can be fixed. So hopefully it won't break it too bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've got some access to some pretty nice screens and some electronics. I'm sure you could beef it up pretty well. <laughs> And then what I would say from a superhero standpoint, I'm a big Marvel fan. Uh, who's your favorite superhero? Hopefully I don't disappoint you with this. I will admit I am not a superhero aficionado, but I always go to Iron Man because he's the engineer's superhero. Um, and unlike Batman, he did all the work himself. He didn't have Wayne Enterprises helping him out. But that's a close second, I would say. But Iron Man. And yeah, he's the, the uber billionaire at the end of the day, but... He's developing all this tech in his garage. So that's a pretty cool idea to think that. To put your mind to it, you can build anything, and you can be a superhero if you tried hard enough. Well, you're in good company. That's mine, too, and I think probably 90% of the engineers as well. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I said. You know, yeah, maybe a little bit of the basic answer, but hey, you know, I'll stick by it. Mike, thanks so much for joining us on the Innovation Experts podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and I'd like you to check out Mike and Keysight to find out more about their specialist products and services. Appreciate you, Cliff. I hope to be back sometime soon. We'd like to hear what you have to say about how test and measurement equipment supports innovation in your industry. So please get in touch with us at technology at farnell.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right. See you all for another interview on the Innovation Experts very soon. Until then, thanks for listening.